So I'd love to welcome our next speaker, and our next speaker is Alan Borthwick. He is a guy I've known for about oh, five or six years, isn't it, Alan, that yes. I've known you. And he's one of the youngest financial advisors in New Zealand, an amazing mortgage broker, and just a guy who is really passionate about making sure that people um, understand money in order to be able to have a better future. So, Alan, I'd love you to tell me a little bit about why you got into the work that you're doing. What's led you to this now? Yeah, so the path of getting into the financial service industry was just accidental. But once I got into it and learned some, learned about process and went through my own journey with money and realised some of the mistakes I'd made over the years, um, you know, I can summarise my education at school on money as don't get a higher purchase, which is, you know, was correct, but there was no context to it that, that did anything for me. So as I've... Uh, and so I've been developing more ideas around this as I've gone. And then in 2011, when I started doing some financial counseling work and got confronted with the reality um, rather than the academia, maybe, and the, the high end stuff we're taught, we're trying to sell stuff to people who have money, it was helping to deal with people who didn't. And how do I get people from negative back to zero and then upwards? And that's, that sort of framed what I see as, I guess, good habits that, you know, if it works for someone who's trying to claw back $80,000 of debt when they're earning 60, um, that it works for anybody. It's, it's concepts that work so that they help people grow and do better than they are, than they are now. So that's mm -hmm. been my journey is developing and testing. And, you know, basically I'm live testing a lot of these concepts every week with new people um, and getting good feedback and as banks change rules and what stuff like that. So uh, it, it's and seeing the difference in people's lives because of the decisions you've made with them and help them do and they're able to see some clarity because they're not getting it from the media or government or banks. Mm. So it's able to get them to cut through the nonsense, see things with clarity from a New Zealand perspective as well. In a lot of cases, mm. there's some good stuff out there, but it's very American, which mm. is fine, mm. but you don't need to sit through something telling you how American investments work. Yeah, um, absolutely. Just... So Alan, what do you see are the current challenges in the education system? I think the challenges are you've got a situation where people are being taught very theoretical in academia and no attack on teachers, but if you haven't lived and breathed the reality of stuff, how can you teach it? I mean, you, you can teach theory, but, you know, and I can see this even at a university level, you know, sitting in a room full of academics telling us how people should be with money and they've never been near a client, they've never been across the table from a, from a family who's going through hard times. So the challenge is, is how do you get the reality of life down to people when stuff changes? You know, through my degree, I was told, you know, it's fun in computer science, so different, but I was told on day one, it was already outdated. I was like, oh, which was great. So the concepts were relevant, but the specifics were not. Well, that's true of everything. You know, if, if you're trying to teach how money works and you're basing it on three or four years ago in New Zealand, things have changed. So I think that's a major challenge is that A, it's, it's purely seen in some ways as a way to get a job, way to get you the next to level to university. It's theoretical and the vocational, you know, there's no woodworking equivalent for financials. You know, there's, I think we might've done some budgeting, in, you know, in first form, uh, whatever that is considered now. I don't know what year that is now back in the day, but it was very low, low week because this was before computers when I did it. Um, and nowadays I've no idea, but again, it's not practical. There's some good stuff out there, but it, it's, it's educating teachers about the reality. And if their finances aren't in order, you know, <laughs> how, and, and a lot of them aren't, how are they going to teach their students? You know, you, you, I don't think you can be an imposter on this stuff. You know, I, I, I am not going to be teaching singing to anybody. I cannot sing to save my life. <laughs> And that's, and that's one of the things, isn't it, is that it is a journey and it's about mm. going from where we're at with our money and then yes. um, and dealing with our, our background, if you like, um, yep. being able to build on that. Mm. And it is about taking that theory away from it. And I think one of the challenges is that money is not something that we've talked about for many, many years. People have hidden their incomes. People don't talk about their expenses. Yes. People don't talk about how they're making ends, ends meet. Mm. It's something that's kept in private. It's a taboo subject. Um, you know, if, everyone wants to keep up with the Joneses, but no one knows that the Joneses are broke as well. Um, and that becomes as a revelation to people. And they realize, actually, I'm not special and unique in this. I'm probably like everybody else. But we hide it because no one wants to talk about it uh, unless we're asking for help. You know, and by that, by that or we're going to hand out by that point, it might be too late. 
Absolutely. So Alan, um, thinking about what do you wish you'd learned at school? I, I wish I'd learned about, um, well, I guess one, one compounding interest um, in, in real specific terms, um, as well as the different effects of that. So from a debt perspective as well, because for all the power of compounding interest for savings, it has the exact same reverse effect when it comes to debt. I think one of the things I've realized is that when you're 16, 17, 18, you've got what looks like forever in front of you. And by 25, you suddenly realize, oh, maybe it's not forever, but it's a long time. And you know, I describe it to clients as when you're 18, retirement, you know, and, and let's say with the, the current expectation at that 65, retirement is another universe, it's another reality. And as you go, you know, then it goes to another planet, you know, and then it's another city. And now it's another, oh, it's another street. And then one day it's next door. And so there's a, and, that, and it's both very slow and very fast. And that's something that I don't think, even now, you know, it's taking a while realizing now as I'm in my early 40s is going, oh, I've, I'm, I'm at a potential midpoint and everything I did leading up, you know, beforehand has led up to now. And if I'm still a negative, I haven't even started yet. So the earlier I can start, so, that it, so it's not even necessarily the maths of it. It's the, the practical reality of what life is. And I'm not sure how easy that would have been to teach a 17 year old who doesn't want to be there. <laughs> but um, in my experience of sitting in classrooms with 17 year olds, which isn't massive, but I've done a little bit of it, showing them core concepts around, you know, the, the, the multiplication of compounding interest, um, the rule of 72, which in the short version is, if you take the number 72 and divide the interest rate on an investment into that, that's how many years it will take to double in value. So if I invest $10,000 at 6% after tax and stuff like that, then it will be worth $20,000 in 12 years. The same is true of inflation when it comes to reducing spending power and things like and things like debt. So that's, if I had known that, that would be something that would have been more useful. Whether I would have done something with it, I don't know, but that that it, that would be a key thing that would have, would have helped me because I learned it by accident in my late 20s and had made a bunch of mistakes. Yeah, already. and that, that's part of this, isn't it? Is that yes. I see so many young people coming out mm. of coming out of school, and they set mm. off, and the next minute they've got, mm. you know, this and that and the other thing mm. on um, on tick. <laughs> yeah, and yes. they're starting to get student loans and all of that sort of mm. stuff. And when they're then wanting to go on and buy houses or start mm. businesses or anything, they haven't got that. Yes, that. I, I, I mean, I, I, student loans had been in for a few years when I was not that I finished school, but was would have been going to, went to university a couple of years later, and I went to well I went to go to Polytech straight you know what would have been my seventh form, and there had been no discussion of student loans because again it was a it was a two or three year old concept that hadn't got down to being taught as part of a standard curriculum, and that was back when it was six percent plus interest. I mean it's, it, and so now it's zero percent, so it seems easier because well it's zero what's the big deal? It's the opportunity cost, yeah. and that's a massive thing. It wrapped all around that, you know, if I was going to be critical about it is, do you really have to go to university now? Which is, I guess, you know, if you want to be a doctor, sure. You know, I don't think I want to get a surgeon who's learning off of YouTube, but there's a lot of stuff you don't necessarily have to go for. You could spend the money on working and developing skills and learning the academic alongside practical. And that's a whole change up. I'm not sure is really percolated, which I've percolated down. And obviously the education sector is probably a little bit nervous about um, but you can do Harvard courses for free online. And, and all that's, one of, that's one of the things that you've touched on in there mm. as well, is the amount of time that it takes to change something. You know, you're yes. talking three years in and mm. it wasn't yet being talked about. Mm. And if you think about the pace of change then and the pace yeah. of change now, it is a totally different ball yes. yep. And you're still in a situation where the system takes so long to change. 100%. Yeah, you've got one of your one of your questions here is so what are the key concepts that you want people to consider financially? Yes. Now am I putting up slides or are we going to do this uh, after you can put up slides if you'd like to? Cool. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, can you need to let me share screens, please? Yes. Well <laughs> Who I am, disclaimer, of course. So I think that the key things I want I want for people to think about and they actually relate to each other was and it's I've done it broadly because I think in the in the other questions we get to more deep, cash and debt. And cash is because they rule everything, right? I mean, and debt is really the absence of cash. Cash is about how do you manage what you have and not go beyond that, right? That's something that's really not taught is that 
you know, and it's not and it's not taught from government because government never live. You know, we are not government. We have to live within our means, uh, and that's not taught to us. And also looking at what the the impact of debt is on your future. I, I something I thought of when I was writing this is debt is your past stealing from your future. Right? Um, you know, if you've bought an item today, and I go into more debt later on, it you're paying you something you bought today. You could be paying for for two, three, four, five years. Now it's, Bad enough if you've bought an item, but if you've borrowed for lifestyle, you could be five years down the road still paying for a party that was this, this weekend. And that's massive in terms of what you're trying to achieve in the future. And cash is simply about the impact of changing how you think about money, your relationship with it, and having a positive aspect to it where you learn to say no to things. Um, so that's probably the, the biggest part, I guess, is the overview of the two key things. I didn't want to go too complex. In fact, most of what I talk about in other questions is about cash and money but how they relate to things like debt and that's one of the things i love about you alan is the way that you're able to simplify everything down yeah. so that it becomes just here two key concepts cash yeah. debt makes yeah. it really simple to yeah. to to follow yeah. so if you're thinking about these two things here then what's the first financial lesson that people should follow live below your means there we go um old fable you know i think i, I can't remember the exact quote of it but it's like you know a man earns you know five shillings you know, spends four shillings, 10, he's rich. He's, he spends five shillings and one, he's broke. And that's, you know, a modern parlance, if you earn a hundred bucks and you can live on 99, you're doing okay. If you're living on 101, you're in trouble. The point of living below our means is you have more opportunities. Um, you, if something comes up, if you are at the maximum of your spending power, you don't get the opportunity to drop your income for a period of time to learn more, to go on that tr trip that, that you need to, to learn to do more for your future. You, you know, it, you, if you're living below your means, you don't have to have as much willpower because you just simply don't have to. Uh, you know, you don't, you're not forcing yourself to stay there because you just, by nature, don't live within your means. And this is by design rather than those few people out there who don't have hobbies and don't, just don't have anything to spend money on, don't have kids, that sort of thing, where they just by nature can't spend it as fast as it's coming in. That's not most of us. Most of us have more opportunities than we want to think about to spend every dollar we earn. And more. Uh, so, and, and for those people, when things do change, they find the habits they thought they had weren't actually there, right? So it's good to live with all your means, but you've got to do it by building good habits and, and having a focus to it and trying to remove any need for willpower. Because life is much harder when you live below your means. From a simple perspective that I can't, you know, if my core costs that I can't get away from are 60, 70% of my income, I can't take a few weeks leave without pay. I can't go on a trip. I can't take a lower paying job because now it's very tight. But if I can get those non-discretionary costs down, you know, down to 30% of my, my income, regardless of what my income is, I've met plenty of broke people on $300,000 a year and people on 50 grand a year with plenty of money in the bank. It's, it's a mindset thing. If you're living at 30% of your expenses, you can make, you've got the ability to make choices. So this is the first step. And it's very hard, say, coming out of school, you know, if you, if you go straight to a job and you've been living on your parents' pocket money or whatever, you know, you finally get to do something. It's very hard coming out of your university where you lived on the smell of an oily rag um, and now you suddenly have money, you know. And I always say, try and live a level below you. You know, live below your, uh, below your income, below your status. Status is terrible. That's a, a, one of the next things I talk about. So there we go. Absolutely. That's really, really helpful. And I love that, um, one of the ways that you framed that is that stealing is you're stealing from your future. Mm. And this is part of that as well, isn't it? Yes. So what's a way to make it easier to manage spending? Yep. So the first step is definitely doing a budget. The problem with the budgets is I've met many a person with a budget that did a budget. And it, I would say, if it was a physical handwritten one, it doesn't do you any good sitting on the shelf. You know, it doesn't look really good as a saved spreadsheet you've never looked at. What I like is something that, and it's not much use. I don't like systems where you track your spending and each month you see how badly you did because it doesn't, that's not real time, right? And you need to know at a glance what you're doing. So I break it down to bank accounts. So you do a budget, definitely, So you because you need to be able to figure out your expenses and make sure that the planned expenses you have are giving you at least $1 in surplus. Obviously, you want to be living well below that, but that's, that's a start. You know, we've got to get from negative to zero first. Then it's about how we structure our bank accounts. And to start with, 
I, I want three key ones. Core expenses, that's regular expenses that are fixed in amount, generally paid automatic payment, direct debit. That's rent, power, uh, rates, insurance, that sort of thing. By putting them in an account that has no FBUS card on it, that is all just there to pay those bills, you can now suddenly ignore them. So I removed a whole bunch of mental effort from my life because I never think about my mortgage payment. It just happens. The money goes in on payday and there's a buffer in there to cover random unexpectedness, you know, if it, like bad timing or whichever, but it just happens. Then I have my household expenses account. This is for regular expenses that are variable in amount and have to be if possible cash. Groceries, petrol, public transport. You might have a Zumba class you pay for every time or something like that. That has an FBOS card. We don't merge the two because I don't want to spend the power bill at the supermarket. And we don't, uh, and because I want to make sure that the money I've got for my groceries is clear. So when I'm at a supermarket, if I've allocated $200 a week for groceries and petrol, and my grocery bill sitting at $180, my tank's got the yellow light on it, and I haven't filled up yet, well, I'm possibly walking to work if I don't, you know, if I need more than $20 to fill the car up. At a glance, I can tell. And then my next account is my personal expenses, pocket money. The money you're allowed to waste. And I used waste importantly because this is core and household is all very responsible spending. You know, there's some fun in there you have to eat, but it's not going out having fun. And pocket money is whatever that means to you. Uh, hobbies, uh, coffees with friends, go to the movies, random stuff that you that you do. And we want that there because I don't want to spend it on the, the, power, on the power bill. I don't want to spend the power bill at the pub. And I don't want to be having the groceries where I'm not sure what's going on. So what this does is we're treating almost every expense you have as a with your fortnightly or monthly as the same regularity. And every pay, we divvy the money out. Now, there are some expenses that are not, don't fit neatly into this. And this is the second part of it. Savings accounts. I call some savings. All savings accounts are pre-spending, but this is definitely pre-spending. We're not saving for the sake of it. These are the irregular things. Things that either we hope don't happen, we want to have a, an amount for each year in case they do, so medical costs, or targets we, we want to make sure we spend throughout a year, so presents, clothing, that sort of thing, um, and things like you know the car wash from Rego. And if I know, for example, that I need $1,000 a year for presents, then that's $38.46, I think it is, a fortnight has to go into that account. So throughout the year, if it's time to get a present for someone, obviously it's December, so it's going to spend the year doing nothing and spike in spending in December. I can look at my app and go, here's how much I can spend. So when I go get my haircut, you know, on this Friday, this Friday, when he gives me the bill at the end, I go, hang on a second, I jump on my app, I transfer the money from my haircuts account to my spending account and pay for it. I need to have to think about if I have enough money for that. So the combination of all these means that every fortnight is the same. A lot of people live at their lifestyle up here. And then, and then one of the expenses comes along and they go, oh, it drops down. And they feel bad because now they're living at this lifestyle for the rest of the pay cycle. But they're living a false economy up here. They never had this much money. They just put all the registration money, presence money, travel money, medical money in their pocket and then spent it. But actually, if you lived here and never lived here, you'd never notice the drop because you just live here consistently. And the money for those other events is building up behind you when it's needed. Now, some situations will blow it out, but you're used to it and you have an emergency fund for it. So we're living within our means. We're not, um, we're not having these peaks and troughs. People who, who every fortnight try and say, right, this month, we, we, this pay cycle, it's power, I'll pay that. On next pay cycle, it's rates, I'll pay that. I guarantee you that one pay cycle, it'll be two of them. And then you're done. This way, you know, and you don't want to be in a situation where a $300 bill blows out your budget. That's, in this system, it can't because every fortnight, the $12 for the car, whatever the number happens to be in your budget, disappears into the account waiting for you. It looks messy on the service. But the only place I'm thinking is I'm thinking here, personal expenses. I'm, and I'm only thinking about, I never think about core expenses. I'm only thinking about household expenses when I'm at the grocery store or at the petrol station. And then I only think about these ones when it comes up. I'm getting my haircut Friday. I don't think about my haircut account other than that because it just does its thing. I've, de I've developed it that way. If I find that I'm spending too much money, and it's going down quicker than I thought, then I need to check my budget. Maybe I'm, I've got my numbers wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. And, I, and then you get that, and then you live it like that every fortnight for the rest of your life, really. And even when you don't need to, right? Even when you've got plenty of money, you still put money aside. You've just got less worries about if you get a bit tweak, you know, tweak it, but it stops you overspending. 
So this is this is what I call the first lesson of finance, right? Is do a budget. And doing a budget, people think is the first lesson. It's do a budget and then do this to make the, but this is the practical from the theory. So there we go. And this just makes it easy. And as you're describing it, it is taking that weight off your mind because mm. it, it's take it's removing so many mm. things that we have yeah. to think about. Yeah. I was talking to somebody the other day who was describing what their mother did, which was when they got the pay packet at home, was they had nine different jars yep. and they would dip the, dip the jars there, there, There's nothing new under the sun. This is the jar system, the envelope system. Um, people have, you know, plenty of people have developed it. I, it's just the version I, I, I've taken the good bits from lots of other people and I've, I use it myself. I've tweaked it over the years. Um, to work with people. Um, some people ask me, hey, I don't see credit cards on your system. And I go, yep, credit cards don't fit on the system. Because yeah. if, I, you know, three examples, if I'm at a supermarket and I've got a, I've got a budget of $200 for the week of groceries, the three ways, like, uh, you know, what are the three options for making sure that I stay with that limit? Cash, an FPOS account that's got $200 available in it, or a credit card with a $1,000 limit that I'm hoping to only spend $200 on. Well, the, FPOS, the credit card is not going to keep me in the limit because I could just spend in I'll deal with it at the end of the month. The bank lets me go into overdraft on my FPOS card, but, but I know at least if I look at my app, that's the limit. I can stop myself better than I can with the credit card. And cash, of course, is you can't overspend on cash. I'm not advocating cash all the time because it is difficult to do these days, but I don't use credit cards because they, they will. The credit card companies are not stupid. They will find a way to chip away at you and make you overspend, even if you don't realize it. Even you know, they, they are patient companies. Well, they're very, very patient. And that's one of the advantages now with the debit cards as opposed to the credit cards. 100%. Card. We use them online, but we have yep. to have that money there. So yes. that's a really, really good thing. Okay, so this is as people are starting off and they're, they're budgeting and they're putting into place these processes to reduce the stress and help us to manage money. Um, what's a trap that people fall into with their finances as the income grows? Yep. Lifestyle. Life's called lifestyle. I think I'm just, so lifestyle creep, keeping up with the Joneses, whoever they happen to be. Um, I, I've heard too many statements. Well, I had to buy this car because, you know, as our insert job here, I should live at a certain level. No, no one has those expectations. In fact, it's you who has them. Um, you know, if, if it's funny when you, I, I've been to a few in the past, you go to a, an auction or something for how, when I go with clients and you pull up and there'd be seven or eight BMWs from all the real estate agents who were showing up. And my first thought is how many of them are on tick? Because I have, I, I, I don't my job. I've seen a lot of car loans in the years, and apparently I heard on the week uh, last week, ninety percent of vehicles in New Zealand are on finance. So it's not a hard guess to assume that that is the case. And of the remaining ten percent, I guarantee a bunch of them are put on the mortgage. So the key here is is that you will get ideally you'll get pay rises. You'll go up in, in, in income and levels. You know, if you if you're old enough to be in the workforce for ten years. You'll look back and you will not, you'll be earning a significant portion, ideally, you know, if you're tying out the kids, et cetera, sure. But ideally, if you stay consistently in work, you'll be earning a lot more than you're earning 10 years. You know, my first job in 96 was on $14,000 a year. Didn't take a lot by 2006 to be earning more than that, right? Um, and, and it keeps going up with inflation as well, but we're earning more. So every time you get a pay rise, well, most people live at 100, New Zealand, I think it's 110% of our income is what we live at. So we're already living beyond our means, you know, um, the, your, your lifestyle will fill up every gap as possible if you don't stop it. So whatever your income is, your lifestyle will fill that. So I have people telling me, I've been a graduate for six months. I was earning $7,000 a year after, you know, like, uh, and the, you know, the, my parents paid my board or whatever. Now I'm earning 45 or 50. How can I have less money when I'm earning seven times the amount? Because your lifestyle filled the gap. You didn't make a conscious decision to do it. So if you, 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 you know, you run a car, you buy a car that, until it runs down, you own it till it runs down. You live at a level below. So if you're a graduate, live like a student. If you're a student, live like you're at home. If you're a middle manager, live like a like a line worker. If you're a senior manager, live like a junior manager, and so on and so on and so forth, right? Um, and, and obviously it's not a hard and fast level, but you know, in fact, ideally it's keep the student like mentality as long as you can, but I appreciate that's difficult to do. For a couple of reasons, one, you know, I, I'm at a level where I could, I guess, if I wanted to go to really expensive restaurants all the time, putting aside the time I had with, with children, you know, the ability to do that. But that once a year or what, you know, for anniversary sort of thing, where you go to the restaurant where you spend a few hundred dollars on, on a meal for two, that feels quite special. But if it becomes part of your routine, then that goes away. And then what happens is you have to go even more expensive to fill that gap. It becomes a dopamine thing. But if you stay living at the level and you enjoy what you've got because you've got a mission for the future, then when you do those special things, you'll actually still feel quite special. You know, if you, 
and I've seen this with people who, and, I, and my curse is knowledge. So I know often the financial situation of people and I just have to keep it to myself because I know that person shouldn't be spending that money. But it's not my place to tell them at 10 o'clock at a pub on Friday night. So if you, can live, if you can live below your level and you don't fall for lifestyle creep, you don't buy a bigger house on the hill because you're supposed to, you don't buy a bigger car when your car is perfectly valid. You know, when it's time to upgrade, you know, because you've got kids and you need something that's moved around better, don't spend $30,000 because you feel you should. Spend 10 or 12 or 15 in cash, because ideally in cash, because it's just as good. Um, and keep that mentality as long as you can. And the difference in your wealth in the long term will make a massive, massive difference. Um, and I've seen that. I've seen that with people, you know. I, I love that link that you put in there about um, keeping... Uh, keeping your mission in mind. Yes. And we've had quite a few people through the course of this conference talking mm. about their purpose, talking about mm. their mission. And it does provide that motivation, doesn't it? Yeah. I've, got a, I've got a reason why I'm living like this. That's and right. it means that we can have that. And, much and it's difficult because if I go back to when I started, when, you know, when you're 25, retirement's another planet, the mission is so far ahead, but it's also not. So you have to break it down into this. You know, I haven't got into it in this because I'm talking primarily the money to get started. But having a clear mission for your future, you know, it might be as simple as, you know, graduate, get the job, get a car and afford in cash, go on a trip on cash, save for my first home, save for my for the wedding, save for my family, you know, keep doing it while also fill, filling in the long term mission. This is still critical to that. And this will make sure that you get to stick to that without having to borrow and deal with it later on. You know, have to, have to make sacrifices that you shouldn't have to make. Absolutely. And for those people that are wanting to start businesses and so on, this is absolutely yep. critical as well, because not only then, then you would also have the, the, the capital, if you like, to be able to start that business 100%. and to bring that, that financial understanding into the way that you're running your business as well. Yes, absolutely. Yep, 100%. Okay, so the next question then is, we do need some of these larger items and these goals. So how do we best pay for those? And you've touched on that a little bit, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so as I was going through my notes of this, I realized that a lot of stuff I'm doing, I'm linking forward and backward, but that's actually the reality of this is that um, pay cash, right? I'm not talking about necessarily, you know, uh, um, taking cash to go buy a car. I mean, I'm talking about paying with, 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 with money you have, not someone else's money you're going to borrow, pay back later on. Um, though, you know, the, the, the first maxim I was taught when I was learning financial planning was, you know, you've got three, you know, three ways to save money. One is a, uh, an FPOS card with a, you know, an account with an FPOS card attached. One's an account you've got to go in and physically get the money out of. And one's a tin can with a hole in the top and the lid welded shut with zero, you know, and you've got small, not these days, it's almost all no interest, but, but you know, there's more interest on the other two, but the tin can is 0%, which has more money. Tin can, you can't get it back, <laughs> right? Until you need it, you have to open the tin, it's more effort. So what I'm talking about here is paying for things in cash by saving the money for them first. Sometimes this is unavoidable. You know, you know you're not going to, I'm not talking about, paying for your house in cash. That would be nice. Certainly not in New Zealand. But if but if you're able to pay for things like a car, pay for travel, pay for consumer goods in cash because you've built up the money and you're prepared to say no for a little while, you're going to be in a much better position. It feels better. And an example of this is this. In my first marriage, because it's, a, it's not, not that the marriage is relevant to this, but in my first marriage, we, we'd go to trips to Australia and maybe we'd spend $3,000 between the two of us. And we'd, do it on a, we'd pay a little bit of cash, but mostly it was on credit card. And you'd come, and A, you'd spend more money than you should have because, ah, I've done this much damage anyway. What The credit card bill is already going to be a problem. Oh, wait, what, what the hell? You know, ask for forgiveness and permission. You'd get back and the bill would be waiting for you and you have to pay it back before you could do anything else. On my second marriage, before we got married, but in my second major relationship, we went on a trip to India. We paid, spent $10,000 each but we save for it for a year or so beforehand and pay for it in cash. We came back with money left over because there was no need. Like I didn't want to buy another rug and I didn't have to because I was I had the money for something else. And when I got back, there was no bill waiting for me. In fact, we had a little bit of money left over and we all we did, what we got to do was instantly start saving for the wedding because we got engaged over there. For, and it was in 10 months time. We changed, renamed the account to wedding and just kept saving. Well, if that had been a trip on credit card we would have kept going it felt so much better it was a six times more expensive trip but it was in cash and the thing with cash is you're looking forwards not backwards right you know i, I i'm not sure the i'm not sure which is worse yet i have no one's told me whether 
where they're paying for it if it's a wedding that for a marriage it didn't last or for a funeral on on debt is worse no i think it's different for each person but that people have borrowed money for funerals or borrowed money for weddings and then the marriage hasn't outlasted the loan right if you pay for it in cash and it doesn't last oh well just carry on right i mean obviously there's other things to it but the cash makes a big difference and it keeps you available for opportunities if i'm saving for a goal i want twenty thousand dollars for and i've got to 15 and then another opportunity comes up that i want more i can redirect my savings or i get to that goal and i don't want to do it anymore i've got 20 grand <laughs> i can use it for the next opportunity so then, yeah so that's the key thing same thing happens with cars doesn't it the number yes. of people that buy a car and they buy it on finance and then they crash the car or whatever mm. and the insurance money pays up but it doesn't even cover the cost of of what yep. you borrowed for the car i, I have know. lost track of the number of people that we've not been able to get mortgages for because of the car loan they've said well i didn't think i'd get a get a get a mortgage so i went and bought a car instead and they didn't go buy a car they went and bought they made themselves feel better by buying a ridiculous car that they couldn't that they shouldn't afford you know, it, it, and now there's no chance. If it's a three or four thousand dollar car loan, fine. But when it's twenty, thirty, fifty-five thousand dollars for a car loan, that's your ability to borrow, buy a house gone for years because you can't just sell it. The car is worth less than what you owe. There's no getting the money back. So, keeping the mentality of paying cash. Yes, there's a trade-off where you know people say, but if, what, I have to do more repairs on the car, for example. A car is a big thing. It's very commonly paid. As in, ninety percent of cars are financed. If I buy a cheaper car in cash, there is a there is a, a point potentially where if I spent more on a better car, it would run down less and I could and I wouldn't have to do as many repairs. But once I pay for that car, if I buy a five thousand dollar car car in cash, which I did early on, I mean my thirteen thousand dollar car cost as much as my pre every other car I'd ever owned combined. I'd owned six, right? <laughs> and but I paid for it in cash. Those that five thousand dollar car might have cost more to run, but I didn't have any debt. So I just kept the money, I just kept putting it aside. So there is a, le a leveling point, but cash gives you options. So I'm not saying buy a $2,000 car instead of a $5,000 car. I'm saying buy a $5,000 car instead of a $25,000 car or a $10,000 car versus a $50,000 car. You know, like somewhere where you can pay for it in cash and afford it because it's got better options in the future. And right now, if my car dies, okay, I go buy a new one. It's annoying and I'll, I'll have, I'd rather have the money, but it's a step back and not a borrowing. Like it's a reduction of my assets, not a not a not a not an increase in my debt. That's right. And the other side of that as well is that you've got your depreciation, which if you've mm. got the, the more expensive car, it's coming down hugely. You've got your interest, yep. you've got all of those sorts of things yep. as well. Be but very we'll aware of the interest cost and stuff. I had someone tell me that they that they who who had should have paid, paid off the car with the plan we did, and then they because the car was costing a thousand dollars a year to do repairs on, they went and bought a new car. Well, they borrowed fifty five thousand dollars for this car. At 12%. Now, now you don't have to be a math genius to know that 12% on $55,000 is more than $1,000 a year. So it was an excuse to get a better car. And then, I'll, and, and you know, for $5,000 of extra interest a year at least. So, and potentially repairs anyway, right? <laughs> Cars are fickle like that. So, um, so I, so one thing I'd say is be very careful of, of I mean, talk about lifestyle, car, car lifestyle creep is crazy. Um, that goes back to one of the earlier slides. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now we've got people living within their means, we've got people starting to save before those big goals, before they spend them, we've got people um, reducing the amount that they're spending on those sorts mm. of things. Maybe it's time to start investing. Mm. What's a good way of starting yeah. investing? So I want to keep this reasonably straightforward. Focus long, I think focusing long term, and the next slide I've got, which wrapped it, which is part of this, this is shows you some of the maths, so we'll do the concept first. Time in the market is more important than timing. I am not interested in what Bitcoin did yesterday or what this company is doing or what XYZ politician said that's changed the market. That stuff happens. I have a graph in my office from one of the providers we deal with and there is an issue every so many years that wobbles the market. So time, being in the market for as long as you can. Start long-term saving as soon as you can. If you're in New Zealand, from your very first part-time job as a student, if you're at school, be in KiwiSaver, getting them, putting, the, putting the maximum you can afford in and when, once you're over 18, putting the maximum you can get in to get your free money from the government. And if you're in other countries, whatever your equivalent is. Start small, it all builds up. It's not about big numbers, it's about steady accumulation of small numbers. And this, and I say investing, I'm not talking, you know, this is not necessarily just for retirement. This, could, this, is, this is whatever, it's savings, et cetera. If you've got goals, this all, all fits to this. I'm not worried at a specific product. I don't care about passive versus active. 
the specific fees. Yes, they're important, but people focus on the product, not the thing they're trying to achieve. What you need to know is what you're trying to do and put aside the money accordingly. So you, but you don't do it, and it's not here, but you don't do it by accident. So you don't figure out what's left every pay and put the money aside. You target, I am putting $100 a week aside, therefore this is happening. And then you figure out your lifestyle after that. So you turn around. This is paying yourself first. Paying yourself first is not paying yourself for fun. It's paying yourself for your growth, and then your bills, then your fun. So that's why I say don't get caught up in the product specifics. Focus on what you're trying to achieve. Yes, if you've got a two-year goal, you would invest differently than if you've got a 40-year goal, 100%. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about don't worry about whether you should be with this company's fund or that company's fund or this term deposit. Just put aside money. That's more important. Get into the habits. To show you the math, though, of long-term, these are two specific graphs. On, on, on this side, you've got a 40-year, 40 45-year-old. This is a 20-year-old, really. So 20-year-old starting from day one at $100 a fortnight investing for retirement or a long-term goal. If it goes up by 3% a year every year, in 40, I've, I've snipped it because it's a long graph. In 45 years, you know, that $100, that, you, know, you can see it goes up $3 at the end of the first year and so on and so forth. At the end of the 45 years, you're putting away $367 a fortnight and you've made 435 grand at a 3% low, low year. Like you, that's a very low return. I don't like to overestimate these things. If you wait till you're 30 and do the exact same thing, you've got $252,000. That's a difference of $180,000. If you've put in $83,000 more on the first land, you've made $100,000 more in free money, interest return. And that's at 3%. Imagine this at four, five, six, seven, if you're doing growth investments. That's why I say time. All right? Now, at age 65, this person's not getting the money out. They're going to keep investing and probably they're going to dip into it. But they've got... $180,000 more options than this person. So that's why I say time in the market. You know, that's a low return. But you've made, a, you've made a lot more money than you would have by not doing it. So this is what I'm saying is, is the get started. It doesn't matter when, it doesn't matter how, but the sooner better, it, you know, the best time was yesterday. The second best time is today. Right, putting some money aside. And, and as we get to the future of things, this is where the impact of debt will come into it, which I'll show Um so yeah, so this is why I say, you know, if you're just start and start and just be in the market, right? Don't look at your key receiver every day or equivalent. Look at it, you know, look at it out of interest and go, that's nice. Oh, it's gone down. That's nice. Because you, you know that eventually it's going to be this sort of number here. So there we go. That's that that's 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 my thing on investing. I don't I don't I don't like to overcomplicate investing. It's not there's lots of very clever people out there with very clever products and things that make it complicated. I don't think we need that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And there's been a lot of people that have been chopping and changing this year, but that's a whole yep. other story. So if yes. we're thinking about, you're talking about time in the market, mm. get in there, just stay, right. Um, what's the biggest impact on people's mm. futures then? Debt. Debt. Debt steals your future, right? Um, this is an example here of, of a debt. So this is a $20,000 car loan at 12%. It's $200 a fortnight, right? So double what that previous growth example showed. And it's going to cost you another $6,600. So if you bought a car, I don't know, you, know, you might have paid $22,000 for it and put in, put in $2,000. It might be, after five years, it's worth seven or $8,000. It's cost you a lot of money to do that. If you could invest that differently, you know, instead, that'd be a huge difference. And this is small beans to what I'm seeing, right? During those five years' time, that, that five grand a year, you're not putting into anything else. Now, can't be used to chip into a business, can't go on a trip. You might not, you know, you can't sell the car for any money, really. How do you, how do you get ahead in the next opportunity? And, and this goes back to student, this is student loans as well, really, even though there's 0% in New Zealand, right? It's the cost, you know, I could do another graph showing you the cost to your lifestyle and student loan, right? So be very clear about what you're borrowing. If you can stay at home, stay at home, live off mum and dad. You know, don't borrow the living costs, you know, or bear money, which is often end up being, you know, because you have to pay it back one day. And I paid, I paid $45,000 in interest on my student loan. So I know a little bit about student loans, <laughs> right? Opportunity cost. So it, I could do a whole hours on debt, but I think the main thing is, look, some debt is necessary, some debt is unavoidable, but whatever we can do to minimize it and not borrow when we don't need to. And that's education, cars, lifestyle, that's a huge 
huge impact on your future, right? Um, and the, like I said, I meet people who, you know, three years ago bought a car on five year loan. Three years ago refinanced the car into another loan. They haven't paid the first car off, and they've got a second car, and now they owe twenty eight thousand dollars on a car they paid twenty four, and they're going to pay forty fifty thousand dollars on these debts. And, the, and, and they, oh, I got a good, I got eleven and a half percent. Doesn't matter. Um, living in cash, all the things I said earlier, and avoiding debt where possible makes the biggest difference to your future. Right? The people I meet at 40, 40 or fifty who didn't get into this level, who you know, who mortgage is down, going is low or nearly gone, regardless of where they started. Right? The difference of their retirement is massive. Every year you could be mortgage free, putting money aside. Even just if you just do a job, you get a job and you buy a house, you stay there for the rest of your life, and you never aspire to massive. You no know, CEO and all that, you don't have to. This is about your situation. There's nothing wrong. I say there's nothing wrong with aspiring to be to work at the biscuit factory and make your money there and spend time with your kids and grow a family and have a house. Because as long as you're the best biscuit factory worker you can be and you live within the means of that, of that person by not taking debt, buying the cars you, that, that are fit your level in cash, be mortgage free as soon as possible, you could be the wealthiest retired biscuit factory worker ever because it because you can be mortgage free by 50 that's 15 years of putting aside money into retirement and i show you know the other graphs before makes a massive difference you could be two or three hundred thousand dollars better off than someone else simply because of the cars you didn't buy and you how you position your 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 mindset so i don't want people thinking that's about well i'm never going to be that aspirational i don't want to work i don't want to be a ceo i don't want to be an entrepreneur i don't want to aspire to this thing i want to have a family and a basic life and focus on my life and do my nine to five, fine. But shape your finances around that, right? Don't do, don't have that like, limit, don't, don't have that career and then try and live like the person working 60 hours a week as a high powered lawyer, right? They don't match. And the high powered lawyer has to understand they're gonna give up some lifestyle stuff, right? But they should be trying to live like the guy who owns Weta or, the, or the, the film act, you know, like you've got to live with it. Whatever your level is, you've got to live there. And it's not a status thing or a class thing or a better or worse thing. It's about the decisions you make in life. And I think that's something is that we're all, we, you know, we'd all like a better car, sure. I'd, there are cars I, can, I aspire to that I'll never buy because practically they take too much away from my wealth. And at whatever level you're at in terms of wealth and income, it doesn't matter. That's the key thing. And debt, debt humbles all of us because you, someone looking at this earning 200 grand a year goes, 20 grand, who cares? And they're right. But that person is not borrowing 20 grand for a car. They're borrowing 80 right, or 100 or more. And they've got a million dollar mortgage or more. Right? And you're talking about cars here, but I look at the young people, you know, and a lot of them aren't necessarily looking at cars. It's when people are getting a little bit older that they're thinking about mm -hmm. cars. But what they are looking at is the technology, is the phones and, yep. you know, computers and, mm -hmm. and those sorts of things or the yep. subscriptions to things and... Yep. Um, I, I, everything bleeds. I mean, the reason I use cars is that a lot of the young people I do talk to, a lot of them, if they're living in a city and something like that, or, or they've got public transport and they're, or they're, they're slightly more eco, eco aware, they're maybe not driving. But a, for a lot of you people in the early 20s, I'll meet 22 year olds with cars that cost double what I paid for mine. And there's just no logic to it. And that's not even at the high. I, mean, I paid 13,000 for my car uh, eight years ago and it's still going fine. I, it, I will run it till it dies. But, um, and literally dies on me, and then I'll go buy one in cash. So it's not that, but you're right. It's it's that. In fact, those are the easy examples. The hardest one is the the every two years a new iPhone, right? You know, uh, you know, if you've got I don't know iPhone as well, but if you've got the Galaxy two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, it's probably right. You want to skip at least a couple of models, you know, and let it run out. And if you've borrowed for them because the, the telcos will let you pay no interest on them, they'll they'll give you a thousand dollar phone, and it's only X amount on your phone bill. Those are harder to track because it's a that's a bleed, right? You know, a sixteen dollar Netflix thing here and a twelve dollar Amazon thing there, and da, 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 da. it adds up. You know, if you add up how if you're a coffee drinker, how many coffees a week are you having? So though, so cars are an easy example, but the the budgeting for things like the slow bleed on things that's more difficult. And yes, I think for some younger people, that's the latest phone, the latest clothes, the latest this, the latest that, the state. That's very much lifestyle, but it's harder to keep keep an eye on because it's, it looks small yeah absolutely and yeah. you know it's it's only five dollars a week on this thing and it's only seven dollars a week on that thing and three dollars a week on that thing but by the time you've got seven or eight of those things and you're on minimum wage or on a benefit or anything like that you know it, it's too yeah. much isn't it 
in many cases, yeah, absolutely. In many cases, you know, we could generally find a couple of thousand dollars a year of money that if someone was serious about stuff, they could free up. Um, you know, they don't often want to, you know, they don't want to give up Netflix. They don't want to give up this, but they want to be debt free and buy a house. Well, you know, and I work on the theory that it's not my role to say that you shouldn't have Netflix. I don't care if Netflix or not, you know, uh, but back when there was a bigger thing, you know, my first five years of counseling work, if I'd written a book, it would have been called All Broke People Have Sky because everyone I spoke to who said they were stuck with their budget and couldn't figure out how to get ahead hadn't cancelled Sky because that was a decision they didn't want to make. Now it's more insidious because it's, it's you know, by the time you've gone through uh, Amazon Prime and Netflix and Hulu Plus and HBO Go and Disney Plus, and, you know, there's, you can end up spending more than you would have on Sky for all the stuff like that. It's, but we could generally find some discretionary spending that people, they don't think it's discretionary, but if, if the goal is big enough, then you will cut the things that aren't important. If you'd rather have, if you won't cut Netflix, then you probably don't want to buy a house. For some people, that's that's the trade-off. And it's being aware of that. And that's okay, as long as you are, you've are you made the decision that I'd rather have this, this Netflix and buy a house. Well, it seems like a long chain, but it's the, it's the well, it's Netflix and it's this and it's this and it's this that leads up to the $5,000 of extra savings in the next five years you haven't got towards a house deposit. You know. And that um, comes back down to what, you, what we were talking about before, which is around the mission, around the purpose. Yes. What is it that you're wanting and how much do you want that? Mm. Yes, one hundred percent. Prepared to to make yep. some of the big decisions. So yes, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Alan, for no sharing your knowledge around finances and for sharing the journey that you have helped lots and lots mm. and lots of people on. Um, with the clients that you've been working with, you've been working with people from a really wide range yes. of uh, of industries and ages and all of that sort of stuff this mm. is so important for yes. people's futures and i really thank you for sharing that for our for mm. our people today happy to thank you very much for the time and opportunity thank you very much mm.